How's it going Chasers? I hope you're having a kick-ass week. Today I'm doing something I've actually never done before, which is to taste this many of my homemade spirits back to back and uh, see what I think while totally not getting drunk. Welcome to Stiller everyone, I'm Jesse and this is the channel all about chasing the craft of home distillation and making it a legitimate hobby. So if you're into making stuff like this, drinking stuff like this, or just learning about stuff like this, this is the channel for you. So I thought that it's been a while since I've tasted a lot of these things on the channel. And I thought, screw it, let's just do, let's do a bunch of them all together. And uh, some of these things I actually haven't tasted for a while. Some of these I haven't told you guys what's going on with them forever. So I'm guessing you probably don't want to know, you know, what we've got here. So, so this is pretty much in chronological order, I think of when I made it, but we've got the Bastard Whiskey, a couple of different versions of the UJSSM, one of my Buccaneer Bob's versions, two of the Irish Peats, the Chimera, two different versions, the high and the low, uh, and the the totally ridiculously easy Ali Mee whiskey that we made not long ago. I have my glassware ready, I'm ready to roll, so let me move all this stuff out of the way so we can actually see what's going on and we'll get down to tasting. All right, so let's start with the oldest because honestly I'm not sure what sort of shape I'm going to be in like when I get to the other end. And uh, this is the stuff that I think deserves the most respect. Because it's oldest. Okay, so this has changed so much over time. So much over time. It was, when it was young, like most of the other things that I've had made from barley, it was kind of... Um, grassy and the best way I've heard it described actually was the uh, Rex from the Whiskey Vault we called it uh, green apple peanut butter and grass clippings smushed together and that was you know pretty dominant flavor in this to start with that is 100% gone soon after that it, uh, it went through a, like a nice little phase of that disappeared the oak had turned up there wasn't a lot of sugar or depth of flavor but it, it just kind of reached a little bit of a mellowing um, more round flavor and I think that must have been at about three to six months after that it went insanely peppery for a while like straight up black pepper peppery and now that pepper's gone on the nose it's eased into this sort of soft cocoa type wood flavor actually a little bit of vanilla yeah this is um this is starting to get really insanely approachable on the nose and it's getting a little bit of something to it a little bit of you know complexity for one of a better word almost like a dusty oaky sort of ness to it like an old workshop an old school workshop hmm interesting all right okay so it's still got a bit of the um the bite and the pepper on the palate but this went in here at 60 percent so that that makes a lot of sense to me uh, and I have not proofed it down at all. So while I'm guessing it's probably dropped in proof a little bit in there, you know, just from opening, breathing, closing again, uh, so on, I, I'm thinking it's still probably well over 50%. I haven't measured it for a while. It certainly tastes like it. It's starting to get that rounder sort of wood sugar. And actually, Josh told me it was a little bit like uh, varnish on antique wood. Uh, not varnish, sorry, uh, oil. Oiled antique wood. And I think that's still pretty accurate. I think I'm going to consider very slowly proofing this down in the in the bottle and down to maybe even about 50% and then let it sit a little while again to sort of pick up some more of the sugariness, mellow out on the spiciness, just a touch. But um, all in all, I think that's starting to get pretty good. And hey guys, it's not surprising, right? It's been in there for almost two years. <laughs> so, you know, so I guess to be accurate and uh, precise with what I'm reporting here, I don't think this is necessarily great as it is, but I see a whole lot of potential for it to either blend into something that's kind of pretty and lacking something on the, on the spicy, more hardcore side of things. Uh, or if it picks up a little bit more of, a little bit more sweetness from somewhere, it'd be something that I quite like, but, but it's probably not for anyone that you know, like spicy, sort of more um, in-your-face challenging kinds of whiskey. Now, in saying that, it's spicy but pretty, not spicy but grungy, if that makes sense. So it doesn't have any of the 
uh, funk, smoke, any of the tailsy sort of stuff going on. It's uh, spicy but pretty. Spicy with the high toasted wood flavor and a little bit of sweetness. Next up we have a couple of the UJSSMs. I know I keep saying that, I know it keeps pissing people off. It's Uncle Jesse Simple Sour Mash, different Jesse, sugar wash plus corn fermented together in a sour mash, distilled like bourbon? Cool. <laughs> anyway, so I decided to pick the two versions of this because I've got four of them still. Uh, as you can see, I'm getting starting to get pretty low on them. Uh, but the the two versions that are the most different. So this, let me switch this so it matches. Uh, this been kept on the charred US oak the whole time, so it's the most sort of you know stereotypically uh, bourbon or US whiskey treated. Hmm. Uh, and this one was pulled out, uh, the wood was pulled out, uh, ooh, when was that? Probably about eight months ago. Uh, and some oak that was soaked in a dessert white wine was put back in there. Um, because? <laughs> anyway, the reason I picked these is because the white wine was furthest away from the bourbon itself, uh, and it hasn't had the charred oak in there, so yeah, like I say, these are the two furthest apart from each other. Hmm, okay, so now this... Both of these went into the barrel uh, at 57% and they are presenting with a fair bit of spice as well. But on top of that they have this, uh, the more sort of candy-ish flavours of bourbon. And from this one I'm guessing that came from when the, uh, the charred oak was in there. I guess for people that, that drink the standard bourbons it's really, you know, a challenging drink. It is spicy. It's still higher ABV, it went in there at 57, I'm guessing it's still probably 52, 53 at least, I haven't tested them. Um, probably not going to for some time. But for me, this is approaching kind of almost a sweet spot between sweet and something else going on there to go really looking for and hunting for. This isn't a whiskey that I'd sit down and drink when I just wanted to have fun, it's something that I'd sit down when I want to kind of play with and, and pull apart and see what's going on under the hood. The wine is not presenting anything like sherry, which I kind of hoped it would when I put it in there, which was a little foolish of me. And that, I think, is adding to the, the desserty side of it, the sweeter candy side of it. Not a whole lot of actual um, grape or wine flavor to it, to be honest, but there you have it. All right, this on the other hand, which has just been on the, the charred oak the whole time, more sweet flavors to it, uh, but more fiery still. Oh, I just remembered I actually added some of the wine into there too. Uh, just a little bit. So the actual sugar from the wine might be taming that down a little bit compared to this one. This is heading much more towards a classic bourbon flavor. But I'll be honest with you guys, they're still, they're just, they're just kind of missing something. They're missing a fullness, a roundness, and honestly I think it's just that over the top sort of corn. Which I think with the wood sort of turns into that butterscotch and full on cherry sort of flavors. Um, so they're very nice, but to me they have, I don't know, they just kind of stand out like they are a sugar wash. Just a little bit, just a little bit. And the reason I say that is that these are now, these are now, uh, what's that, like 18 months old. It was pretty much Christmas time in 2017 these went down. Um, and they're still, they're still lacking compared to the, some of the other things that are coming up soon. Now that... Could be the process, it could definitely also be the fact that I've learnt a hell of a lot in, you know, a couple of years. Next up we have Buccaneer Bob's Rum, which is a, uh, a pretty consistent rum from the Home Distiller Forum, I think, I think it was the first place I, it, it was put up. Uh, but it is a Blackstrap Molasses Rum, and I did use Dunder for this, so it is not your pretty sipping run-of-the-mill, off-the-shelf uh, rums that you're going to get. It is, you know, heading more towards the Jamaican-style high estus type thing. Uh, and it is being aged on uh, one stick of toasted oak, which was toasted at 220 degrees Celsius, and uh, 3X UJSSM sticks that came out of the stuff before it, right? When I switched it out. Yeah? Uh, so this is not, once again, it's not going to be big and sweet and you know sort of wood chewy uh it's also in there at 63 percent which uh yeah 
I'm beginning to regret those decisions early on, or at least when I did it, maybe do one of each, 63 and then 54 and be able to blend the two. It's sort of something that I'm toying up with more and more. So I'll be honest, I tried this a little while ago and this stuff takes you on a journey, man. You smell it, but it's like pretty nice, sweet, you know, cooking molasses, a little bit of banana and tropical fruit. Not a lot of the wood, actually, but it smells like dessert-like, almost. Mmm! <laughs> Until you put it in your mouth. <laughs> you put it in your mouth and it goes bonkers. Absolutely bonkers. You get a hint of the same flavors you get on your nose. It whips you straight into wood spice and a little bit of funk, and the funk that I'm talking about is uh, barnyard funk. Just a touch of it. Not full on horse blanket or anything, just a hint of it. And then it pulls you back from that into pineapple, banana. It starts to finish almost headsy. It has an almost headsy flavor to it, which I think is probably just the high ABV and the spiciness of the wood. But once again, this is a while ago for me, so I could have made a screw up on the, on the cuts. Uh, and then it draws you back down to the, the, uh, the sweetness of the molasses and more towards the... Uh, the blackstrap molasses flavors, so the deeper, darker stuff. It's not, not quite all the way to, you know, full-on Marmite sort of flavor, but it's hitting there. Now, actually, I want a little bit more of this before I, before I mess with it. This is straight out of the barrel. What I have here is one milliliter of the rum extract that comes along with, you know, with what Buccaneer Bob suggests you do. If you want to learn more about this, hit the card up top. That'll tell you about it. But uh, I'm going to start by just putting half a mil in here. So the aroma hasn't changed a whole lot. It's brought out a bit of orange and um, like nutty caramel almost. But honestly, that might be just that it's proofed it down a bit and opened it up. This stuff's about 40% ABV. Mmm. Mm -hmm. So you still get taken down that sweet road to start with. And it starts to do the, the crazy funky bit in the middle. And the added sweetness... Uh, from this stuff has sort of sort of cuts that off and brings it back towards the the blackstrap flavors the real dark molasses flavors much quicker and makes those more intense so let's go a little bit more of that that is a totally different rum totally different rum the dark blackstrap is taking over much more now so yeah definitely tobacco like right through the dark sugar sort of scale off the end and it's almost heading towards um uh still not soy sauce or marmite yet but i think if you went much further it would probably start to head that way so if you do do the buccaneer bobs thing guys i would thoroughly recommend you following through totally with the instructions and making some of this stuff as well two different rums two entirely different rums next up we have the irish peated whiskey now i know this can Seem a little weird, it's scotch that's peated, right? Well, Irish whiskey used to be peated, not so much anymore. There's still a few commercial examples around. Um, actually, I can only think of one, which is Connemara. I think there might be one other, but if anyone else knows, let me know. Uh, anyway, I love Connemara. I think it's freaking delicious. So I wanted to make something, not a clone of that, but kind of inspired by that. So that's what we have here. Now this stuff, <laughs> this stuff was really kind of crazy when it first uh, came off the still. The day it came off the still, it was insanely peaty to me. The next day, the peat was almost all gone and it was replaced by this weird, footy, funky, alfalfa y weirdness that was kind of horrible, but also kind of delicious. <laughs> A little bit like blue cheese or something like that. You know, like the first time you try it, you're like, oh my god, why would you eat this? This just tastes rotten. And then, um, it kind of grows in you a little bit. Anyway, it has changed a whole lot since then, and it's been in these jars for uh, almost a year now, I think. Actually, probably right around a year. This one here is on charred American white oak, and this is on charred maple. Oh, God. I made a mistake. I should not have... Uh, hold on. Whew. All right. I should not have... I should not have had that rum in the middle. I, I need to go ask wifey on this one a little bit. Honestly, guys, I'm struggling a little bit after that rum. So uh, let me come right back. This is right up here, Ellie. It's petered, so here we go. 
All right, we're back. I'll let you know what wifey said and then I'll build on it a little bit. Um, I feel like after tasting it a bit with her and talking about it, having a couple of drinks of water and stuff, I, I feel like my palate's back a little bit. So let's do the maple first anyway. So the footiness is still there and the aroma on the maple doesn't go a whole lot past that to be perfectly honest with you. You don't get almost any smoke. The funk is definitely heading further and further away from just straight up footiness and uh, alfalfa more towards an earthy funk. The earthiness was always there, but it's, it was sort of, uh, it was almost like a scale from footy <laughs> to alfalfa-y and then leaf littery, and it's moving much further towards the leaf litter side, which is something that you get a lot of in a lot of islas. Uh, so I think it probably is coming from the peat. And to be honest, you get, let's face it, you get alfalfa and foot and uh, crazy stuff in, in peated whiskey anyway. So... Not that far off, but this one sits, compared to this one, further towards the footy alfalfa side. <laughs> when you drink it, interestingly enough, the peat comes out. Um, it is a little bit odd. The syrupiness of the maple is, is pretty, pretty prominent. I wouldn't say it's huge, it's not crazy sweet, but it's, it's syrupy and then syrupy plus, syrupy plus leaf litter plus smoky plus a little bit of grunge it's kind of a little bit weird to be perfectly honest with you i'm not entirely sure how i sit with that uh, but the body of the maple is kind of welcome that's interesting uh, especially you know this stuff's relatively young um from the beginning i was wanting to get this up into you know multiple years and i think tasting this i, I still like to do that anyway on to the american oak so the aroma coming off this is much more pronounced than the maple it has a hint, it's, it's actually got more sweetness on the nose than that does. And this is new American oak, it's not secondhand American oak like a scotch would normally be, it's, it's new American oak, so that's kind of interesting. It still has the, it still has the dirty grunginess, but it's pushed more towards the leaf litter side. Hmm, okay, interesting, interesting. So obviously it's lacking the body and the syrupiness of this. And it could probably do with a touch of that, but I think the longer it sits, it's gonna get that more and more. Uh, it's got a whole heap more of the ashy, ashy sort of smoke flavors. Definitely, definitely. Okay, yeah, heaps more ash. Uh, a little bit more peat. Yeah, yeah, a little bit more peat. Um, much less of, much less of the alfalfa side of things as well. Right now, I would probably lean towards this slightly, but if I was a betting man, I would say in six months' time, it's going to be hands down the uh, the US white oak. Perhaps with a little bit of us blended into it. Actually, why not? It's, uh, it's about two to one uh, US oak to maple. Okay, the flavor, the, the aroma's disappeared somewhat. Interesting. So I don't know if you guys watched the glycerin test that I did, but... Putting the glycerin in seemed to mute pretty much everything else. It's almost like that. It's very similar to that. I don't know how to react to that. <laughs> it made it a much more rounded whiskey. That's for sure. It made it a much more complete whiskey. Technically speaking, I would say that's better. It's got, it's got a beginning, middle, end. It's got a lingering spokiness at the end. Almost nuttiness, actually, with the two of them blended. Hmm. Yeah, okay. I can see that. I, I honestly think in the future, guys, that I might be blending in probably those ratios. So that's about one and a half to two liters, I'm guessing. And that's about one liter. This, uh, this is actually a little bit of a bonus one, guys. I didn't mention this at the beginning. This is the malted corn and rye that I did uh, a couple of months back. And it has been sitting here at 51% on uh, some Oak Rimmer Balconis Barrel in Texas, a distillery in Texas that's been recharred. Uh, and wax back in here. So I recharged it to about a number three, number four char. Popped it in there at 51% uh, and here we go. So this is a completely all grain spirit. There's no table sugar, there's no, there's no fuckery whatsoever. There's just, it's just straight up uh, grain, but it is malted corn. So straight away, there's just something different about this than everything else I've tasted so far. And and I think it's the difference in ABV going into here. Uh, it could be, it could be because this is the first all grain corn 
spirit that I've made as well. It, it could very well be that. But I don't think so. There's just a fullness around this, a velvetiness, I guess, that is much closer to a commercial spirit, much more approachable, and it's kind of delicious, to be perfectly honest with you. <laughs> it has a... Um, it has like a an almost table malt quality to it that's quite alluring as well. At the same time, it's a little bit, a little bit like a, you know, like a beer glass from the night before sort of flavor. Not the sourness, uh, but the oxidized sweetness. The um, cardboard is definitely not cardboard, but it's heading that way. Hmm, interesting. I'll see if I can see if I can circle back to that flavor later on and, and give it a proper name. But um, it's got a little bit of that in there now, and it had more when it was you know, straight off the still. I think that flavor that's in it is going to turn into something quite awesome later on. It's, it's been slowly progressing down this, this path of that flavor disappearing more and more and um, more delicious things taking its place. So obviously this is a lower ABV than everything else that's come before it, uh, probably even now, but there is still this smooth and velvetiness to this that the others aren't really getting now. That, I think, probably could come from the high corn content compared to high barley content and the other all grain ones. I'm struggling a little bit to decide exactly where that difference is and I'm struggling a little bit to articulate it and I have been for some time since I first made this. I knew that there was something different about it when I first made it. Definitely sweeter, that could be the corn, it could be the wood at 51%. Definitely more velvety and approachable. Uh, once again, that could potentially be either it's richer it's fuller I don't want to say better but I think it's more complete right now so I think the others if I gave them a long time to mature they could turn into something quite cool just based on the progression they've had so far this right now is is a more complete spirit than just about anything I've tasted other than other than probably the bastard but that's you know like I said quite a challenging grab you by the groin sort of spirit so it could be the corn uh, better oak, actually, too, coming from Balconis. We know that it's going to be good oak. Uh, it could be that it is the uh, barrel proof that it went into the barrel at. It could also be the fact that I'm just getting better at this, which is probably highly likely. <laughs> it has a borderline butterscotch, but not quite butterscotchness to it. The rye is peeking through, and I, I don't like the word spicy. It's not spicy. The, uh, the bastard is spicy. This is earthy. Not earthy like the leaf litter from the peated Irish, earthy like... The peated Irish is like if you walk through a rainforest and you kick up the leaf litter, it's that smell. This is like a sweet garden soil that's almost good enough to eat. It's uh, earthy like some of the cooking herbs, I guess? Cardamom? Sort of similar to that, but not cardamom -y, if that makes sense. Uh, but there's, de there's definitely something to it that's rye-ish. Once again, I'm struggling to put my words exactly on what that is, but... Um, I'm falling in love with this one pretty quick, and I think, I think I'm gonna have to make more of it. <laughs> yeah, so I've changed outfit because it's actually a couple of days later, slightly tipsy Jesse did something messed up with the camera and uh, didn't record it. So we're gonna do the rest of the video again, which is cool, I get to taste this stuff again. Yum. Uh, before I do, I need to say a huge, huge, huge thank you to these people here. Uh, the Patreons. It is the Patreons that keep the lights on around here, guys, so thank you very much for that. Uh, if you're not sure what Patreon is, essentially it's a way for you to donate directly to the channel if you're finding value in these videos and you want to keep them going. Uh, check the link out down in the description, that'll take you over to Patreon, you can check out the different tiers, so on and so forth. Another little thing that I need to say now, guys, is a reminder that I am going to be in Austin, Texas this October for the Bastards Ball. Last week, I told you I was going to have a meet and greet on the 5th of October. That is incorrect. It is not the 5th. It's the 15th. It's still not confirmed 100% yet, guys, but but uh, it's, it's shaping up to be the 15th at a bar in Austin. So what we have here is the Chimera. Now, the Chimera is an all faints run. It is literally everything I have ever made crammed into the boiler, the faints. Um, so, you know, the leftover... Uh, heads and tails from stuff that I blended before. All the other things I've tasted before in there. And then another run was made with them. Pretty solid, you know, pretty tight cuts were made. And what I actually did was split it into the, the top and bottom of the run. So at the beginning of the run, it was more rummy. And at the end of the run, it was more like a, kind of almost like a wheat whiskey or um, something like that. Wheat, but more like wheat bix, like shredded 
bran or bran, that kind of wheat. Anywho, uh, so that's the high and the low. High on this side, low on this side. Let's give them a nudge. Yeah, so this smells really similar to the Buccaneer Bobs that I talked about before, but even sweeter. More vanillins, more of a sweet, approachable molasses, even on the aroma. By the way, guys, these are aged with some toasted French oak and also some charred American white oak, both the, the same. So yeah, banana and tropical fruit esters, the wood's peeking through, getting a little, little of vanilla, not a lot of toastiness from the wood, almost a touch of citrus as well. And it's really, it's really quite approachable, very, very pretty. Almost no alcohol burn whatsoever, which is hilarious, right? Because these, this is the top end of a whole bunch of heads put together and tails put together. So if anyone tells you to throw that stuff away and never use it, I don't know, man, I'd, I'd question that. Toasted oak shows up much more on the palate than it does on the nose. It is still leaning towards rumminess, but there is much more of all of the other grains influence showing up on, on the palate. Hmm, that's really quite interesting. I cannot wait to keep this tradition going. I really can't. I will need to make more spirits more often. Uh, it'd be cool to maybe do this once or twice a year, but it's a, it's a, yeah, it's fun. If you guys haven't done this, I would highly recommend it. From a conceptual point of view and from a taste, it's, it's fun. I'm sure the taste will change every time, but the, the concepts don't. Yeah, so this is totally different. This is almost confectionery sugar on the nose. None of those tropical fruit esters. No trace of rum. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So the wheat comes out to play. The other grains are there a little. I can't figure out why there's so much of a, a heavy sort of wheat impact on this. And it does. It tastes like wheat bix, man. If you're from anywhere down under, you've had a whole lot of wheat bix for sure. And it's really got that, that flavor quite strong in it. Super interesting to me, team. If anyone tells you that there's nothing to distilling and it is simple and you know cuts are not a thing or the the point that you collect from during a run is not a thing do something like this and show them because these taste like two completely different spirits and they came out of the same damn boiler <laughs> now these versions these versions were oaked pretty heavily there's a lot of oak in it per volume i wanted to get these ready for christmas and i believe i believe you know what i think i'll probably just bottle these for christmas take some with me to austin as well probably delicious though real tasty all right, guys, lastly, we have the super easy all grain single malt. Now, of course, this wasn't all grain in terms of the home brewing sense. I did not make the mash for this. Came out of a can in the form of LME, liquid malt extract. Um, heaps of people telling me it's not a whiskey because it's not all grain. It's made from sugar. Nope, bollocks. It's all grain. It's, it's made from grain. It's just a different brewer did it, not me. It came in a can. It's expensive. <laughs> it's much more expensive than uh, all grain brewing, but by God, it's starting to taste delicious, guys. I gotta tell you. Now, this used to have that oxidized beer flavor uh, even stronger than what I was talking about in one of the earlier uh, drinks that I tasted in this video. That was even stronger. It's mellowing out into something else uh, even quicker, and to be honest, I'm not entirely sure why. But the trajectory for that was this, this big sort of oxidized grain, uh, almost like... Almost like a bad IPA that's got too much uh, crystal malt in it. it. It's a similar flavor to that, but not quite an oxidized IPA with too much crystal in it. Yeah, so it, yeah, it's pretty similar to that actually. There you go. That's what it started off like. And now that flavor is turning to caramel. Oh yeah, it totally is. And it's, um, well, I think that's what's happening because this flavor is dying off and the caramel's bumping up. It's still stronger on the palate than it is on the nose, but um, I I think this is going to do something special. Now it's oak, it's aging on uh, second hand oak, so the this is more oak that was used in the UJ SSM. I'm going for something very much like a pretty approachable, sweet, uh, caramelly scotch. That that's what I'm hoping this is going to turn into over time, which is the reason I'm using the second hand UJ SSM oak in it. On the nose, that oxidized crystal malt flavor has died off a lot. Caramel, vanilla, a touch of ginger, actually, which is kind of interesting. On the palate, that flavor's still there. 
but the flavors are heading in the same direction. Now, the reason I really wanted to crowbar this in, guys, I think this shows the underrepresentation of specialty malts in distilling, both commercial and home distilling. Now, this was a amber malt to make an amber beer out of. It's going to have specialty malts in it. You can taste it, you can see it. It may have crystal malt. I don't know exactly what they used, and honestly, it's whatever. But it is not just a base malt. I guarantee you that. And it's doing something cool. It's, it's fun. So I think I need to be experimenting more with base malts. I'd love to hear if you guys are experimenting with base malts. That's the reason I left this to the end. I want to... The people that are still here and still watching this video, I want to know what you're doing with uh, going, you know, above and beyond base malts, using specialty malts. You know what that flavor? Maybe it is just the crystal malt. Maybe that's what it is. I don't know. Anyway team, I hope you enjoyed the video. I know this has been a long one, uh, kind of crazy. This is very obviously for the people that are regular viewers and want to know what's going on with the stash, with the, uh, with the seller, whatever you want to call it. So I hope you liked the video guys. Uh, I'm not even going to tell you guys to subscribe. If you're still watching, you're already subscribed, I'm sure. Make sure you hit the thumbs up for me. Drop a comment in the section down below. That helps me out a whole lot and I, uh, I thoroughly appreciate that. And you know what? I love going down there and seeing what's going on. Uh, I'm sorry it's taking me a little longer to get back to the comments, but I, I will try and keep that up as well, team. Anyway, anyway, enough yabbering. I'll catch you next time, team. Keep on chasing the craft. See ya.